Hello, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. We are in our Message to a Messed Up Church series, focusing on Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, and today we are focusing on legal problems. The scriptures to be studied are found in chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. I encourage you to download the Life Notes by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now here's Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6 is our text. If you're in the room and you don't have a Bible and uh, you want to follow along with us, grab one of the Bibles and the seats around you. Turn to page 1134. That's 1134. You'll find 1 Corinthians 6. You'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. Uh, We want you to have a Bible and read it. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and want one, uh, message us. We'll be happy to get you a Bible um, through the mail or through delivering it because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, how many of you uh, have ever in any capacity been to court? Who's been to court? Ah, what is wrong with you people? No, I'm just saying. How many of you really liked going to court? Uh, Okay, there's a few people whose hands went up. Uh, I think uh, some of those are like, we adopted uh, our baby. Uh, It's all good. So uh, here's the thing. I've been to traffic court uh, more than once. (laughs) And it wasn't fun, no matter how it turned out. Uh, I've been to court for jury duty, never was selected, thought it was going to be. And they went, oh, you're a Baptist preacher? And they kicked me out. Uh, (laughs) But that said, uh, I'm thankful for the American justice system. I mean, it's far from perfect, but uh, I'll just say this, it's still the best in the world. Our founding fathers blessed us with the genius of innocent until proven guilty and uh, guaranteeing us all kinds of individual rights. So that's a, that's a, a great thing, but my goal is to never again be in court. So today we're continuing our study in 1 Corinthians. And, and uh, if you're just catching up with us now, 1 Corinthians is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a messed up church. And, and you look, the Corinthian church was a complete mess. Paul started it. Uh, he left to continue his missionary journeys. And this place just fell apart. I mean, he's already addressed. But we're just getting to chapter 6 or 16 chapters. He's already addressed their divisions and their, you know, immaturity. He's addressed their arrogance. Last week we talked about how they were tolerant of this, you know, terrible sexual sin in their church. So he's, you know, he's just continuing to address their issues. And so today we're looking at a passage where Paul addresses Christians dealing with legal issues uh, I mean, this church has many problems. This is one of them. So you're going to continue, if, you, if you're here before, you, you're going to continue hearing the Apostle Paul uh, speak uh, sort of as a parent to children. That, I mean, that's how he's addressing this. So hear that in his voice, <laughs> whether you like it or not. He says, when one of you, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? See, he's been real encouraging there, isn't he? (laughs) Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now we're going to stop right there 
because I don't know if you noticed or not, but the problem is believers are suing each other in pagan courts. Believers are suing each other in pagan courts. To be clear, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church, people who are committed to following Jesus. So if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, Paul is assuming some things. First of all, he's saying, hey, I'm writing to you. I'm writing to those who are already in the family of God. He's writing to the church in Corinth. So if you're a follower of Jesus, Paul is addressing us right now. If you're not a follower of Jesus, listen in, because these are the expectations of the family of God. If you're checking things out, then know what you're getting into. Now, but he's also talking to people who, if you noticed at the end, he says, look, you were, used to be this mess, and now Jesus has changed your life. And so uh, th that's kind of what's wrapped up in this is Jesus is addressing us who are followers of Jesus who have experienced this life-changing relationship with Jesus. And, and they lived, the church in the first century lived in a society where people worshiped many gods. They were polytheistic. Uh, there were temples of, to all different kinds of gods around. They worshiped in crazy ways. We'll talk about some of those things in the coming weeks. And they had very, very, very different values than Jesus' followers. Now, because people are sinners, including Christians. I mean, we all know that. We, we continue to struggle with our flesh. People in the church had disputes. Paul wasn't saying you can't have disputes amongst yourselves. I mean, we don't know what those disputes were. Maybe they went into business together and it didn't work out. Maybe someone loaned money and it wasn't paid back. Maybe someone sold something and it was defective. I know none of that stuff ever happens to you. But uh, we don't know what the disputes were. We just know it was serious enough that one Christian was taking another Christian to the courts that were run by people who did not believe in Jesus at all. No values that were similar. So Paul's first point of disgust, let's just call it that. He was disgusted with them. You can hear that in the, in the room as we read the text, right? Not a happy camper. His first point of disgust was, don't you have wise counsel in the church who can settle disputes from a Jesus perspective? I mean, don't you have anybody who can do that? Someone who can mediate and judge the dispute? And he's just like going, hey guys, can't you solve this amongst yourselves as followers of Jesus? And uh, obviously they didn't. Or what's more likely is they wouldn't submit. You know, the... the the people would, couldn't agree, hey, you know what? Let's go to this person. He's wise. Let's bring our dispute. Let's lay it at his feet and let's let him decide what the outcome is and submit to that. See, that, that's the biblical model that Paul's suggesting. And we tried that here at Calvary once. I'm just being honest, it wasn't my idea. A guy came to me, he had a business dispute with somebody else in town who went to our church and he said, hey, and he told me all, I was like, Can you, would you guys do this mediation thing? And I, I said, all right, we'll be biblical, we'll do that. Here's the conditions, I picked the mediator, I'm not gonna be a part of that, number one. Number two, you gotta abide by what he says. He goes, yes, let's do that. And uh, so I put the people in the room together, three people, Guy who was the mediator was a Christian businessman, manager of a, uh, actually one of the utility managers here in town and, and had been in town, respected, wise. He listened. He came up with his, what he thought was the right thing to do and the guy got mad because he didn't get his way. <laughs> Left the church because he would not submit. Didn't want to follow. And, and see, that's the pride piece in this that, that gets in the way. Paul's saying, hey, look, we can settle this ourselves, but most of us, we want to win at all costs. We want to win. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. We're not willing to say, hey, yeah, I will submit. Um, now, one of the, the good things is in the United States of America, we have a biblically-based justice system. I say biblically-based because when we were founded as a nation, that was their principles that, that, that were instilled in our government, in our justice system, in our Constitution. Not all judges, prosecutors, attorneys obviously have a biblically-influenced worldview, but it did start that way which is why we've been blessed for all these years uh, in, in our country. And then Paul gets to his second point of disgust. Not only you guys don't have someone wise enough to settle this dispute, but he just goes, look, isn't it better just to suffer injustice than make Jesus look bad? Isn't it? I mean, isn't that what he said in verse seven? 
To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not suffer wrong? Why not be defrauded? Why not be like Jesus? Why not? And, and, and he's just going, look, this is, a, this is a character issue. You know, we can't really represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And, and he's saying, hey, guys, trust God to be your defender. Trust God to take up your cause. Trust God for justice uh, instead of fighting for yourself. Because uh, if fighting for your rights makes Jesus look bad, is it worth fighting for your rights? I, I mean, that's what Paul is saying. Hey, it's, isn't it better just to go ahead and suffer the injustice than to, to mess up the cause of Christ so that you can win what you want? He says, you've already lost because you're making bad decisions. And then Paul's third point of disgust was simply, why are you wronging and defrauding your brothers? Right? I mean, look at verse eight. But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. He goes, you shouldn't be, wrong, be wronging or defrauding anybody, period. But why are you doing it to family? Why are you doing it to those in the church? It, this doesn't make any sense to Paul. He is like, look, you're being evil. You're supposed to be different now. You're supposed to be different. Uh, by the way, Paul is declaring if Jesus has changed your life, then he alters your values and your ethics. Let me say that again. If Jesus has changed your life, he changes the way you think and you act and you believe. He changes your values and your ethics so that you don't have to win every argument. You don't have to win every battle. You don't have to always be right. You don't have to be the one who comes out on top. In other words, he says you act in love. And by the way, love doesn't steal from anyone, much less family. And he goes, you used to be that way. In all these different sins, and he lists a whole bunch of sins, and most people focus on the sexual ones. But um, uh, you read that, we're all guilty. Some way, shape, or form. He says, that's who you used to be. That's who you used to be. But since Jesus has changed you, your behavior should change. Why are you having this problem? I mean, that's at the root of it. Paul's really like just mad because you guys are being a bunch of babies. Um, by the way, uh, that's why our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And it's, we're, not, we're not trying to sell you on church membership plans. We're not trying to, you know, promise you how easy this is going to be. What we want you to do is surrender to Jesus because we know if you do that, Jesus will change your life. And, and that's what this journey is all about. We don't just want to sell you a bill of goods. We want you to experience a relationship with Christ that makes you different than you were. Uh, if we call Jesus our Lord and nothing changes, something's wrong. Uh, by the way, if uh, there's a passage in Matthew 7 where Jesus pretty much teaches on that, uh, and I'm going to be addressing that on the 25th. So start coming to Summer Life this weekend, or this Tuesday. I'll be doing it next Tuesday. And you might want to read Matthew 7 and, and get a glimpse of that. Uh, when Jesus said, why do you call me, you know, or many who say to me, Lord, will not, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone. So check it out. Uh, anyway, so I think what Paul is getting at is this. In all of his anger, and all of his frustration, and all of his, uh, you know, just disgust, he's trying to say, look, our identity is in Christ, not being a victim. Our identity is in Jesus. It's not in being a victim. Now, people were being wronged, or they felt wronged, or victimized, and they were exercising their rights for recourse. And they were doing it in the public courts, instead of settling it in the church, because they didn't trust the people in the church <laughs> that are supposed to be having the same values as them, the values of Jesus. And so he said, hey, uh, you guys are, have your identity in the wrong place. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with advocating for justice. In fact, you could argue that if you don't advocate for justice, you're not being a godly person. Okay, so don't hear that. This is not about not advocating for justice, but it is definitely misplaced when our identity becomes that of a victim. Um, by the way, all of us have been victims. Can we, can we just go ahead and acknowledge that? 
All of us at some point in our lives have been victimized by someone. Some of us many times, some of us once, but those are moments. And those moments should not become our identity. And and see, the problem for us, when I say us, I mean those who follow Jesus, the problem for us is when we begin to identify as victims, when our experiences of victimization come to dominate our understanding of who we are, it replaces Jesus at the center of our lives. And we begin to see things through the lens of victim rather than through the lens of the Bible. We begin to see things through the lens of uh, being victimized rather than through the lens of Jesus. And see, that's why Jesus wants to get into our life and he wants us to deal with the trauma. He wants us to deal with the hurt. He wants to deal with the, the, the brokenness so that we don't live in that place where being a victim defines who we are. Now, as victims, again, if you own that victim identity, and there's a piece in all of us that lean that way, we may not want to identify it, but uh, one of two things tends to happen when that victim identity tends to take root in our life. Either we become advocates of ourselves. You see that a lot today in this world. You know, we act selfishly. We demand uh, what we want uh, we protest uh, if we don't get it. We, we deserve more. There's all these selfish statements. Uh, but we become advocates of ourselves. Or the other thing that happens as victims is we tend to deny that we're a victim, but we still, lived, we still live a trapped in guilt and shame of a victim. So even though we, say we don't claim victim status, we let the victimization haunt us and carry over in our lives and damage us because we won't live in the freedom of healing in Christ. Neither of those is having a healthy identity in Jesus. Okay, that's not a Jesus identity. See, when we look at Jesus, Jesus was victimized, but he wasn't a victim. Jesus was victimized, but he won the victory. I mean, you look at the whole passion, experience of Jesus. In his arrest, trial, and crucifixion, Jesus was a victim of betrayal by a friend. He was a victim of false arrest. He was a victim of corrupt trials. You know, that's the picture of injustice, right? He was a victim of abuse of power. I mean, he was declared innocent and then condemned to die. That's a miscarriage of justice complete injustice, and yet in experiencing that, Jesus gives us the victory over sin and death and hell. In his moment of complete victimization, Jesus won the victory of sin and death and hell. And and we need to see that as followers of Jesus, because if we adopt a Jesus identity, which by the way is what it means to say, I'm following Jesus. It means no matter what we face, no matter what we experience, no matter what we endure, that we know God will redeem that injustice. Let me say that again. Doesn't mean the injustice is okay. Doesn't mean that that those actions are, are approved of God or anything like that. It just simply means that we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those called according to his purpose. And so even though people are doing evil to us, God is in the midst working to redeem our lives. But we have to have that Jesus identity to see it so we can get there. And so many times we are the ones who short circuit God's redemptive work. Because God doesn't approve of the abuse you've suffered or the assaults you've endured, the betrayals you've experienced, the thefts or discrimination you've encountered. But God does redeem our lives and God does promise to execute justice. God promises to execute justice. Now, if we live as victims, anger and self-righteousness, because we were victimized, can drive us beyond justice to want revenge. Sometimes to seek revenge. You see it playing out right now as people who uh, uh, have been hurt and marginalized want to hurt and marginalize other people who are of different races or ethnicities Uh, instead uh, of recognizing that everyone's been a victim. Romans chapter 12, uh, the Apostle Paul paints a picture of the Jesus way. And and this this is for all of us. He says, 
do not take your own revenge. But leave room for the wrath of God, for vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. For if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. I like that part. <laughs> Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, now that's the call that we have when we're facing injustice. When, when we're in that place of being victimized, Paul is saying, look, don't take your own revenge. Don't, don't get fixated on you carrying out your version of what you think justice should be, but uh, let God have his way. Now, if you're struggling with a victim identity, if you're trapped by your shame and guilt and secrets, can I just tell you that Jesus can set you free and change your life? I mean, that, that's what the promise of the gospel is. Jesus can set you free and he can change your life. And God doesn't want you to live you trap, live, have you live trapped in any circumstance, whether that's circumstance of addiction or denial or uh, guilt. He wants to set you free. Now, he can do it miraculously in the moment if you ask, sometimes. But usually what he does is do it through a process. Whether that process involves trauma therapy, counseling, celebrate recovery, can I just mention Monday nights, 6.30 in this room? Uh, we have it. And what happens when you show up and, and you go, hey, I've been, I've been hurt, I've been crushed, I've been pain, I'm stuck in this place, uh, is people will walk with you through that recovery. It's not like they go, hey, glad you're here, take care of you on your own. No, it, it's a, it, there's other people who are on that same journey come around you and, and try to encourage you and walk with you and say, hey, you can make it. Uh, because uh, I'm making it too. Again, I'm going to go back to this hard truth. The hard truth is all of us are victims. And all of us are perpetrators. See, all of us have been hurt by other people. And all of us have hurt other people. That, I mean, that's, that's life. That's what sinners do. We hurt people, we get hurt, we hurt others. Uh, and, and yeah, different levels and different ways and, and stuff like that. But that's why we need the grace of God. That's why we need to be forgiven and we need the redemptive power of God to set us free so that we can love people and bless them in Jesus' name effectively. See, obviously in Corinth, their identity was not in Jesus because they were fighting for their own rights and they were willing to hurt each other and they did it in trying to, to win the battle in courts. Their identity was in the wrong place. Paul says, if you had the identity in Christ, you wouldn't care about that stuff. You could be defrauded. You could suffer the abuse. You could survive it because you're trusting in Jesus. Paul says, choose the Jesus identity. And that's not easy, but it is worth it. But then in the bigger picture, this passage then begs the question, when should we take legal action? I mean, it is about legal action. It is about Christians suing other Christians, Christians taking other Christians to court. So what should we do? Uh, I mean, if our identity is in Christ, there are still times when the legal process is necessary and I'm gonna say encouraged. So what, how do we know? If we're like, hey, I don't want to defraud my brother, I don't want to be defrauded, what's, what's the point? When, when, is, when is it okay in the eye of Scripture that, that I can take someone to court? Well, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you two for sure instances, and then the rest you're going to have to just like pray about and figure it out and figure out where your motives are. First of all, um, you can take someone to court when a crime is committed. When a crime is committed. Forgiveness does not remove accountability. Okay, forgiveness does not remove accountability. Uh, accountability makes all of us better. So when someone commits a crime, we should engage the legal process. You go, well, well what about grace? Well, they can find grace in jail. It's okay. <laughs> See, um, here's the thing. When you reject victim status, you forgive and you hold accountable your abuser, attacker, or thief. So what we did here at Calvary. So back in 2002, we discovered that uh, our then school director 
uh, was embezzling money from the school account at CCA. And uh, so he, he stole about $70,000 altogether. We turned it over to uh, the police. They did an investigation. They arrested him. Uh, he had charges. They handed it over to the DA. DA fumbled it, but still uh, plea bargained it. And, uh, and then we got to go to court. One of those times I was in court was a hearing on how much his damages were going to be. And uh, I told you, he sold 70000 The The judge uh, said he had to pay 20000 back. We got less than $1,000. Don't care. He still has a felony record. Also found out that he had done this at least three other times to other churches, including killing churches and ministries along the way. We held him accountable. So if anyone actually does a background check, they can see that he has a record. Okay, we held him accountable. And here's the cool thing. God redeemed and restored in such amazing ways because we never, I hate to say we never missed the money, but God provided enough. In fact, Calvary Christian Academy now, over 20 years later, is thriving, close to 300 students, and we're planning to expand in the high school. I mean, <laughs> see, we didn't, uh, can I just say this? We did not get justice in the courts, <laughs> but God won and God redeems. And, and, and that's why you know, I'm saying, you know, hey, this is what happens when you do things God's way. Now, we offered forgiveness. He didn't really interested in that. But, um, but, you know, God's in charge of all those things. Maybe we go back to last week's about handing people over to Satan and all that stuff. But anyway, the, uh, and, and God redeemed in so many ways besides just the money and the school and stuff like that. So one of the things that, that God really taught us out of that was that accountability is a great thing and we have tight financial controls and we have a lot of accountability so that we're not susceptible to those same types of things. And, and, and it has blessed us well for over two decades as we have gotten better and better and better at handling the money and protecting the money so that we can invest the money in the kingdom of God. So uh, look, when a crime is committed, you need to go to court. That needs, you need to involve the police, which means, uh, let's be really blunt. Ladies, if you're being abused, call the cops. Okay, hey, look, if you're being beat up, call the police. You go, well, he didn't mean it. Yes, he did. He meant it, and he's going to do it again until there's accountability involved in his life, and that accountability is going to have a uniform and handcuffs. You go, well, but I don't want him to go to jail. Boy, he might need to go to jail for God to redeem. It's okay. That's how God works, his accountability. Parents, if your kids are abusing and selling drugs and stealing from you to support the habit, call the authorities. Call the authorities. He's not getting better. She's not getting better until you hold them accountable. And accountability for illegal behavior can be the path to redemption or at least protection for yourself and the rest of your family. You go, but that's so harsh. I, look, I, I've, I've had this conversation with parents numerous times. Are you willing to do whatever it takes for God to redeem your child? Yes. And, and it, you know, they always say yes. And I go, okay, I mean, you might need to send them to jail. Well, no, I can't let them go to jail. <laughs> I go, then you're telling God that you're not willing to do whatever it takes for him to redeem. We got too many people's stories of how they met Jesus in jail around here to, uh, to go, hey, that's, that's a bad thing. Now, sometimes God needs to put you there so he can speak to you and you'll listen. And, and so, you know, parents, when a crime is committed, in, you know, involve the authorities and, and realize that sometimes for God to redeem, you need to be willing to go places that you don't want to go. Um, so, involve the courts, involve the legal authorities when a crime is committed and involve the courts when defending what is just and protecting others. Um, look, because we live in the United States of America, because we are blessed, we have rights. Okay? Every one of you has rights. If you don't know what they are, read the Bill of Rights. It's really cool. Um, you got all kinds of rights that, that, God, that God has given you that the government has recognized reluctantly. Um, but, uh, but we have those. Now, here's the thing. When you start demanding your rights... Um, that's kind of selfish. I have my rights and I, you know, there, there's that voice again of 
self-protection, self-promotion, self-preservation. I want to win. I know my rights. I have my... If you hear yourself saying that, you might want to check your motives and think about it. But it is always right when you are defending others' rights. It is always godly when you are defending other people's rights. Uh, which is one of the great things about the U.S. because I can defend your rights and, and know that I'm standing on, on good, solid, biblical ground. I, I, look, we can defend each other's rights. It's just not about you promoting your own rights above other people or against other people. Does that, uh, does that make sense? That, there's that, uh, that idea of defending others is a, is a good thing. You're serving them. Um, now, most of the time, we're not doing that in the legal system but there are organizations that do that for uh, groups of people. Uh, I, I just, just these legal nonprofits that fight in courts to confront injustice and protect the innocent. Maybe you've heard of some of them. This is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. Pacific Legal Foundation, they, they exist to defend American citizens from government overreach or abuse. Amen. Uh, Alliance Defending Freedom defends religious uh, freedom, freedom of speech, sanctity of life, and biblical marriage family issues in courts. The Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty defending free expression of faith. And, and there's so many others that are uh, nonprofits that, that litigate these court cases where your rights and my rights and the rights of other people are infringed upon and they want to fight for the little guy. That, I mean, that's honorable. And so if you can defend others' rights, then great. Get involved. But always remember this. Whatever we're doing, our identity is in Jesus and we're representing him. So remember to represent him in his character. Because we really can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And we don't want to be like the Corinthian Christians who are making Jesus look bad because they're being selfish. Um, and we don't want to take any action, including legal action that's based in our selfish desires. But there are appropriate reasons for choosing to take legal recourse. Now, I hope that helped. And I hope to see you serving Jesus and not in court. Let's pray. Father, your word challenges us. Even when uh, it brings up topics that we don't think about much, or we don't like to cover. And, and we just acknowledge that. We need to learn more of you. We need to learn more of your ways. We need to think about that in areas of our life that normally we don't let it infringe upon. So help us to live selflessly. Help us to adopt an identity in Christ. And help us to be the, the men and women of God that you've created us to be. Um, Lord, whether we find ourselves in courts or whether we find ourselves in um, the community or whether we find ourselves in church, we want to be the same people who love and who bless people in Jesus' name. Help us to do that. That's our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When we choose to follow Jesus, our identity is found in Christ. We're no longer victims because Jesus won the victory. We want to get to know you and have arranged a series of virtual meetings to do so. I invite you to attend one of our upcoming community connections. You can visit calvaryaz.com forward slash events to learn more and sign up. I hope you will. Well, that's all for now. Bye-bye.